Hi, my name is Elizabeth Best, um, and I'm recording this lecture for the students of History and Indigenous Studies 326, the history of Indigenous people since 1850 at Simon Fraser University for my friend and colleague Cody Grote. Uh, Cody and I met at Laurier University in Waterloo as um, fellow historians in the same field. We both study Canadian and Indigenous history. Um, but we're also connected as community members of um, the same, roughly the same area um, as urban indigenous folks. Um, in 2019, I did a lecture with Cody's father, um, William Bill Grote. Um, we did a joint lecture because we're, we um, are both survivors of the scoop um, from different generations and it was really interesting to have both of our perspectives, me as a person whose journey brought them through to university and through the PhD program, and um, Cody's dad is just like an amazing person. His life experiences are like really great, but we'll get into that um, later on in the lecture. So the format of my um, lecture I'm supposed to be talking about um, week 10 residential schools and child welfare in your syllabus. Um, residential schools are a little bit outside of my expertise. I'm um, more comfortable talking about child welfare. Um, so that's kind of what we're gonna uh, focus on. Um, Cody also mentioned that uh, the class would be interested in indigenous research methods, which is like another, um, part of uh, what I do as a PhD student, PhD student and how I live my life more generally. Um, personally, I think that um, the PhD part of my life is the most boring part, so um, I'm interested to see like what I know about Indigenous research methods and kind of like this is a really good um, lesson for me as well as a student um, just coming into my own as an academic and yeah so the first part of my lecture will be um, a demonstration of indigenous research methods um, where I locate myself and who I am and why I'm where I am in my journey and then I'll talk more specifically about research methods um, after that and I'll talk about like the academics who um, I look up to or whose methods I integrate into my everyday and then after my talk on indigenous research methods, I will give a broad overview of the 60 scoop. And then um, I will talk about uh, my own dissertation research because it's relevant um, to everything that I'm talking about, but it's also relevant to Cody and to Cody's dad. Okay, so uh, locating myself, um, essentially I have a very complicated um, history because of my time in child, the child welfare system. I have a very complicated identity because I'm mixed race. Um, and essentially my PhD research and my MA and my bachelor's have all been um, whether or not I was aware of it has all been a part of reclamation and trying to understand how I got into the situation. What, what was the context of, I don't know, the world before I was born that um, led to this sort of confusion and misunderstanding and um, having to go through a colonial institution in order to reclaim who I am and um, come to terms emotionally as well as intellectually. Um, every time I introduce myself, I do it in a different way because I'm in my late 20s, which is already a confusing, horrible time, um, and then add on um, several different identities and a global pandemic.
and a dissertation proposal and it's just there's just like a lot going on so every time that I introduce myself I I either leave something out or I add something new that I didn't the last time um, and that's not because I'm like I'm unaware of things it's just that sometimes um, it's harder to talk about things and um, sometimes m one or more of my identities um, is I don't know more pr prominent or more or I'm choosing to identify more with this aspect of myself um, yeah so my name is um, Cecilia Elizabeth Best. I was born in Edmonton, Alberta um, in 1992. I was placed into Saskatchewan Child Welfare System um, by the time it was Christmas in 1992. So fairly quickly, um, straight from uh, my biological family into foster care. And then I bounced around in foster care until I was eight and then I was adopted out into a non-indigenous family who subsequently moved to Ontario so um, I find it very difficult to answer the question where are you from because I'm from everywhere and I'm from nowhere and um, I'm recording this lecture uh, from Waterloo um, I've been in Waterloo since uh, 2011 when I came to go to university at uh, uh, the University of Waterloo uh, for my undergrad. I uh, All of my degrees are in history. I did not branch out. Um, I did not expect that I was going to become a PhD student. I, I personally always thought I was going to go to law school, but it didn't work out that way. Um, what else should I say? I... I am Vietnamese on my paternal side, and I am Métis on my mother's side, um, although I get the sense from the limited information I have about uh, myself that the Vietnamese side of my family is not part of like where I'm going to reconnect with in the future. Um, the Métis side of my family, from the limited <laughs> knowledge that I have, today, which is March 11th, um, 2021, uh, is that they are from, they are Métis people from Northern Saskatchewan. Uh, I think it's really important to stress that my journey is constantly changing and I'm constantly finding out new things um, because um, identity is such a fluid construct but also especially people who make a career out of talking about their identity um, they run the risk of con like of confusing people because it's not like a cut and dry thing so um, it's important to that I stress that I have a lot of work to do I have a lot of like healing work to do I have a lot of learning work to do and um, I can't say I'm right at the beginning of it, but I'm, uh, there's just still a lot that I don't know. Um, the places that I feel most comfortable, um, considering that I had a very unstable childhood and um, I moved around a lot, I feel most comfortable um, here on Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee territory, and a lot of my teachings and the things that I bring forward are from Anishinaabe elders because that's um, who I have access to in this urban space. Um, I do not speak for Indigenous people. I only speak for my own experiences. And in this lecture, I have permission from Cody and from um, Cody's dad um, to talk about uh, Bill's experiences as well. But um, Every person who grew up in child welfare has a completely different experience and 
it's my goal to make sure that I tell the context of the stories, but I also, um, I also tell the story the way that um, my community members would like it to be told. Um, outside of academia, I am an athlete. I play basketball and ultimate. Um, I play ultimate pretty competitively. I play, I've been playing basketball since I was eight and uh, I'll, I'll always love basketball <laughs> more than ultimate, but ultimate I play competitively. Um, uh, other than that, I'm also an artist. I sell beadwork, um, although I wouldn't necessarily define myself as a beadwork artist. Sometimes I get like caught up in trying to sell and capitalism as a form of like making money with my art, but um, I am a multimedia artist. I am working with a lot of fabrics right now and working on a jingle dress and uh, yeah, I sell, I sell beadwork, although I'm trying to kind of like get away from that as I focus more and more on my dissertation. Uh, yeah. Like I said, I always locate myself completely differently, so if someone asks me where are you from tomorrow, I might answer that in a totally different way. Um, yeah, I'll just <laughs> end this section here. <laughs>
yeah, those are those are my three source materials that I use in academic settings. But a lot of my indigenous research methods have nothing to do with school, and it has everything to do with what you do outside of school. Um, I also think that it's important that I'm more specific about what indigenous indigenous means in this um, scenario and um, for the most part the people that I look up to the people that I emulate are Anishinaabe um, like I said before I'm Métis um, so I'm doing I'm trying to do more work about um, my own journey there's another book um, that meshes Métis and Anishinaabe together and um, gives us context about um, that gives us more context about how Anishinaabe and Métis teachings are very similar and that um, it is possible to um, like cross-reference things um, especially for urban indigenous communities um, basically because that's what I have access to as a city d dweller and a person who's been alienated from land. Um, yeah, so it, when I say indigenous research methods, I don't mean to, um, I don't mean to say that all indigenous people are the same or there's one specific way of doing this. There's so many different ways and this is just one way and I don't speak for all indigenous people. Um, yeah, so what else do I want to say about indig indigenous research methods? Okay, so my personal indigenous research methods are based on the medicine wheel and the seven grandfather teachings. Um, there's no way that I have time to talk about those two things today. Um, the seven grandfather teachings, like, those could go on for a long time. Um, but the two that I really carry with me the most are humility because I find that humility is like the hardest thing to um, maintain in the academy, especially when I feel like a baby in my ceremonial understandings of culture and my spirituality and um, my understanding of time and how young I am and how much more time I have, hopefully, <laughs> on the planet to learn more things um, from a historical perspective as a historian but also as uh, a, a spirit having a human experience. Um, the other one that I practice um, from the seven grandfather teachings is love and I also find that that's really hard to maintain in the academy because of how genuinely uncomfortable um, a lot of the institutional spaces make me as like a woman who is visibly um, not white um, but also ethnically ambiguous um, no one has any idea no one guesses what my identity is unless I unless I um, what's that what's unless I amplify it so like with my long black hair and braids and earrings and clothing which is like a very important part of how I um, express myself um, so for me remembering humility and love is really important in the Academy um, because as we get more institutionalized we kind of forget where we came from and um, for me I'm doing this work on a shirk um, a scholarship that lasts three years and this is the first time that I've ever been above the poverty line and so I have a lot of survivor's guilt um, about taking money from the government while also writing a dissertation about how the state did horrible things to my people and that we shouldn't take money from the state but also this is the only way that I can make this work happen um, so yeah, Humil hum humility and love, I could go on. Um, but the other thing that I, for my research methods that I always keep in mind is the medicine wheel teachings. Um, essentially, what the medicine wheel tells me is that I've got to try very hard to continue to be a well-rounded person. 
Um, so I take care of the physical, I take care of the mind, I take care of the spirit, and I take care of the heart. And um, for me, taking care of the physical means um, working out and being an athlete. Um, that was the first identity that I ever had growing up was um, once I was more settled and I was able to be a member of a sports team, that was like one of the first identities that I created for myself. And it's something that I'm struggling with as an older athlete, um, especially an older female athlete. There's not um, as many supports as there were um, when I was part of a system. And uh, yeah, so I try, I try very hard um, to take care of the physical aspect of um, my being, which is again very, it's a lot easier um, because my friends are athletes and uh, we, we kind of do that together. Um, in terms of uh, the spirit, I go to ceremony um, when we're not in a global pandemic. Um, ceremony is really important. The first thing that comes to my mind when I think about that is that I've been on a year-long very fast and um, there's a lot I could say about that as well. I haven't had berries since uh, February 2020 and I'm just now starting to start the processes that come out of my berry fast. Um, yeah, you can feel free to ask me about that. I could go on. All I'll say is that um, it's it's like a rite of passage. It's a rite of passage um, that I would have had um, at a younger age if I was brought up in my culture. Um, but it's not misplaced having this very fast happen later um, because in a way I am coming of age at um, the age of 28 um, because I'm on a different journey and this is the very fast just came to me at a time when I needed it and essentially my very fast has been the entire pandemic and one of the first times that I'll be able to have community whenever we get vaccinated is going to be for my for my very fast so it's all connected there's all there's a reason for it um yeah so that spirituality aspect of me I'm very new and I'm I'm still learning and uh I'm definitely willing to talk more about that if you'd like. Um, another aspect of the medicine wheel is um, the heart, um, the emotional side. Um, this is something that I've been like actively focusing on lately because COVID winter was so rough and I live alone and I, community is such a big thing for me that not having access to humans has been very tough and I've had to learn other ways to take care of myself and I've put a lot of my feelings a lot of my heart medicine into my art recently and my art has really like blossomed um yeah so I talked about the physical I talked about emotional the heart I've talked about oh the last one obviously <laughs> last one is mind um but I guess the rest of this lecture and the fact that I'm doing a lecture um, about my journey is how I take care of um, that part of the medicine wheel for me. Um, yeah, um, I think after I built a, an identity around athleticism and um, the physical part of the medicine wheel the next part of my identity has always been school because school, regardless of what foster family I was in or what adoption family I was in, I was always put in school and I could, I could, always, I could always rely on that kind of stability in my life. Um, so I think that's kind of why, that is one of the reasons why I'm, I'm doing a PhD right now is because um, education and reading books and writing papers is something that um, comes very naturally to me but also that's how I understand the world I understand the world through books I understand the, the world through academia um, and I understand that that's a very colonial way of doing things 
and I'm looking forward to reaching the end of my PhD and going out and doing other things for, for a bit. Um, yeah, so Indigenous research methods um, for me um, are the seven grandfather teachings and the medicine wheel, but it also has to do with combating this um, old style narrative of Canadian history where impartiality is like the most desirable thing where um, there used to be a time that non-indigenous academics were talking about indigenous people as if we were disappearing or as if we were incapable of telling our own stories and um, there is a lot of overlap between history and um, the way we come to know as indigenous people which is through storytelling. So I like the fact that history is about um, talking about our experiences. Um, I'm very involved with my research, just personally. I'm doing this research as I'm like discovering things about myself and as I'm trying to get my own um, childcare records from the government. So it's tough it's tough and it um my journey doesn't always overlap with the academic calendar and i have to remember that <laughs> um when i'm pressuring myself to meet deadlines and things like that but i'm having the hardest time reading yet another horrible book about the shitty things that the state did to our people and to children um so that's that's why indigenous research methods are so important because when I'm feeling that way I can turn to the medicines or I can turn to ceremony or I can go to one of my social worker friends and be like this is my f this is what I'm having this is what I'm feeling and um, I don't know those feelings are part of it if we don't feel the things that we're um, trying to pass ourselves off as experts about I don't I just I personally don't see the point like what's the point and for me, the point is that um, the policies that were put in place um, in the 1850s are still affecting us today. They're affecting us today because people don't understand. They don't understand that they don't. You have to sit down and have a conversation, a long conversation, and probably multiple conversations about systemic oppression and genocide and loss of culture and why this is confusing um so yeah that's why i think indigenous research me methods are important and that's why i also stay in a mainstream program because i think there are more things that we can do to cross-reference um, the best of both cultures all cult of the things that i represent and um, find a way forward. Okay, so um, now I'm gonna go over um, what the 60 Scoop is. This is the academic-y um, part of my discussion. And yeah, here we go. Okay, so. In the 1980s, uh, this guy named Patrick Johnson wrote a report for the Canadian Council on, the social de on social development to investigate why Indigenous children were overrepresented in foster care. His report was entirely statistical. It was very broad. It went through um, province by province, just numbers. It was just numbers. It was like, I think there may have been some references to um, legislation um, to understand like how this was happening and sort of like different temporal times across the country um, Yeah, they this country has like a very complicated Understanding of who is financially responsible for indigenous people because one government signed something and then another government didn't sign something so it's, This is not an easy conversation 
Okay, so Patrick Johnson compared numbers of indigenous children and non-indigenous children in care, and he is the one who named the phenomenon the 60 scoop because, like I said, he did this in the 1980s, and he was looking back the last 20 years, and um, unfortunately the name stuck, and it's a complete misnomer. The 60s scoop started happening at the end of the 1950s, went through the 60s, went through the 70s, went through the 80s, went through the 90s, and in 2021, indigenous children continue to be overrepresented in care. So this is not a thing that happened in the past and then we're over and we're done with. This is something that continues to this day. Um, Children were apprehended in alarming numbers in the 1960s because federal policies of assimilation changed, their, their wording changed. So before the 1960s, it was about education. It was about residential schools. And in the 1960s is when people started realizing that like those residential schools weren't working anymore. We need a new policy. So the state decided to change the language of assimilation from education to integration. And this is when provincial schools started integrating indigenous children into them instead of residential schools. So this is when residential schools started to close. But residential schools and child welfare policies such as foster care and adoption are very much linked. The 60s and the millennial scoop were not the result of one specific policy. Instead, it was the outcome of a series of child welfare practices across the country. For example, on-reserve child welfare con continues to be underfunded fun with 70 cents to each dollar spent on children off of reserve. So my research specifically um, speaks to urban indigenous children taken off of reserve which is um, representative of legislation. So uh, legislation essentially excluded reserve children until a certain point and it's different for every province. So like the um, children who are living on reserve were taken um, on a case by case basis and there's no way to generalize it. There's no way. Everybody is um, experience is different and that's what makes it so hard to talk about. So my personal research indicates that as residential schools closed, the number of children in care actually increased. This increase um, is due to the fact that children were taken into care where there were no foster homes or adoption placements available. As a result, ind indigenous children were placed in residential schools under the auspices of care. There were no social workers involved past apprehension. Children placed in residential schools for reasons other than education were not treated the same way as non-Indigenous children who were apprehended. So there's this report called the Caldwell Report that was, I think it was published in the 60s, and it was around this time when they were changing the language from assimilation to integration. The government and the council, a council that represented social workers at the time, um, paid Caldwell to go into the schools in Saskatchewan, which is where I study. Um, and they, the point of his um, interviewing of Indigenous children was this thing called the California Personality Test. And he was supposed to go in and he was supposed to interview children and write a report about how well children would integrate into provincial schools um, based on this test and he did that he did he like he did the test and everything but he also found that the number of children enrolled in Saskatchewan's residential schools had increased in the last decade and he got access to um, the like what's that word like the um, the records that they would, the pieces of paper that they would create in order to intake, that's the word. He got, uh, <laughs> he got um, access to the students' intake records and he saw that there were a number of students that were placed in um, residential schools um, with uh, social work or um, social welfare reasons listed as, why, as to why they were being put there. So 
he documented that and kind of like hid it into his report and then like gave the results about like how well children would integrate which is like complete bullshit um but i mean that's how i got a lot of this information was because he like snuck this extra information into this report um and this like this tracks with other things that i've read um about finances so the really boring base of my research was a lot of financial records from the Department of Indian Affairs, the federal government. Um, and the shadiest thing that they did was essentially uh, rename or reclassify where money was going. So at a certain point, um, the education and the social welfare um, columns were separated and then once it was clear that um, residential schools were going to be um, shut down and we had to move to a new form of genocide <laughs> that's what it is um, they started changing where the money was going and where the money was coming from and they did it in a way that makes it very hard to track um, so Around in the middle, the middle of, I would say like 1960s, 1970s is probably when this happened. I can't remember off the top of my head, but I'm pretty sure. Um, that's when it becomes harder to track the money. And the money used for social welfare increased, and the money used for education decreased. Um, and then it reversed. Um, so schools were were getting more money for education because they were actually being used for social welfare reasons. And then that's when they made it more confusing. Um, another um, series of primary documents that I've looked at that um, supports what I'm saying is the provincial records um, for the social welfare department in Saskatchewan. And um, it breaks down, like they had to write an annual report every year. So I was reading annual reports throughout the 1960s and the 1970s. And um, the number one reason given for the removal of indigenous children from their communities is what the profession labels neglect. Um, but like ne ne neglect could mean anything. And essentially social workers were going out into the field with no money, no resources, no foster care placements, no adoption care placements, but they had residential schools. So they were going into communities once the legislation allowed them to go into reserves. They were already doing this to urban indigenous families. They were going in and instead of dealing with the institutionalized poverty, intergenerational trauma from years of residential school, um, inadequate um, infrastructure, housing, running water, they just took the children away. And instead of providing support for the parents, they took the children away and cr created even more trauma. And then they put those students into residential schools with no plan on how to get them out. And um, in the period that I'm looking at, the numbers of students in residential schools increased. They also increased in care. And then, um, once they realized that this was like becoming an issue, um, I'm still trying to recreate. So this is all like based on very impersonal um, annual reports and numbers and um, documents that don't give me faces or like names or um, like personal stories for these things, but I don't understand how social workers could be going into these homes and just being like, yeah, we're just gonna take the children and just like not deal with like all the other things that are going on. We're just gonna create the more trauma for this community. And then write this report and be like, hmm, I wonder why like this is happening. I wonder why there are so many indigenous children and there's nobody to take them. Anyways. So once they realized that this was like a problem, instead of like stopping and not taking children, they decided to run this program called Adopt um, Inuit Métis, AIM, A-I-M. And it was this uh, advertising program um, aimed at 
well-to-do non-indigenous folks to try to convince them to adopt brown babies because they kept taking the brown babies and nobody wanted the brown babies so they had to convince people through ads so there's like a um they talk about it in the annual reports in Saskatchewan about like how effective the AIM program was, which, spoiler alert, it was very effective. Um, and there is also evidence um, in newspapers of, and I've heard anecdotal evidence of people talking about seeing these ads on TV and in the newspaper where they would like feature like a super cute brown baby and talk about how like how needy this kid was and how um, much like indigenous people wanted non-indigenous people to take care of the babies and how it was important to like buy into white man's burden and like take care of take care of us um, yeah, so that was 1960s, 1970s, and then into the 1980s. And in the 1980s is when academics started actively looking into residential schools and talking about it. It was very... The reason why I know this part of my research is because I was in a PhD class um, with this professor near retirement um, who told me that it's impossible to know why there were so many more um, nuns and women entering the convent, whatever that is, um, to become teachers in the 1850s and the eight to the 1890s, because like we just don't know. And I was like, I'm pretty sure that's because that's when residential schools were like founded. And he was like, well, this research was done in the 1980s, and like there, nobody in the 1980s was talking about it. So I wrote a paper about all the people who were talking about residential schools in the 1980s, which was like a lot of people. 1980s was like when this, when the research for all of this like started. So that guy's wrong. And um, the 1980s was definitely a, a time when it started to be problematized. And so um, there's a lot of, excellent literature about how to fix things and um, indigenous people were throughout the 1970s and the 1980s were getting together as communities and um, either writing reports or um, founding new organizations and um, uh, Indian control of Indian education was like a big thing in the 1970s and then it um, spilled over to um, child welfare um, so, yeah, so like the 1980s, this was still going on, but there were also counterbalances um, where more indigenous people were getting involved in our own child welfare. Like I said before, uh, in 2021, indigenous children continue to be overrepresented in care. Um, there are court cases across this country which are fighting for recognition, recognition and compensation for gross misconduct on the part of the federal and provincial governments. Um, the 60 scoop officially right now um, refers to children who were taken from their communities between 1960 and 1989, and the millennial scoop refers to 1990 onwards. So um, I, I was scooped in 1992, so I don't quite um, meet the criteria for the um, 60 scoop um, settlements that have like gone out. I know some people who have received their 60 scoop settlement, and according to the federal government, the cost of a childhood is between $20,000 and $50,000. Um, but that's up to personal opinion. <laughs> I think that um, knowing about the 60 scoop and knowing about child welfare, um, I don't mean to like generalize things to make people uncomfortable. And I try to say the state instead of the government because the state is like a faceless entity and it's a self-perpetuating, um, I don't know, institution. 
Another one of my research areas is the development of the welfare state. That's like the non-indigenous part of my research that I'm trying to indigenize essentially. Um, but the reason I think this is important is because um, the way that residential schools are taught, the way that the topic is taught, and the way that the Truth and Reconciliation Report is written and taught makes it seem like residential schools closed down and then the government stopped interfering with indigenous people and stopped trying to assimilate us and like that our intergenerational trauma clo like ended when the last residential school closed which was 1996 um, and that's just not true it's like patently false because the state realized that residential schools were not um, bringing about the, the assimilative results that they expected way back at the founding of this nation. Um, so they changed, they changed tactics and they were, the confusion around the 60 scoop is on purpose. So financial responsibility is like one of the biggest, easiest ways to like track the 60 scoop because throughout the 60s and the 70s and the 80s, each province had to work out a financial agreement with the federal government. And then indigenous people had to like decide like where their allegiances were. So the best example for this that I know of is that throughout the 60s, the Federation of Saskatchewan Indians fought the federal government as they were trying to pass off financial responsibility for indigenous people to the province because they're right when they say that um, indigenous people did not sign um, treaties or agreements with the provincial government they signed agreements with people who promised to be representatives of the queen the king i don't know <laughs> um i think it was the queen uh but yeah, so what it ended up doing was creating a financial and um, on the ground confusion about who was responsible for who. And also during this time, the professionalization of social work um, was developing and there was a transition from government bureaucrats to college regulated social workers and these these people who were like doing the, the physical scooping the physical bringing them in and like um, signing all these documents and um, making these reports uh, these people believed they were doing the right thing based on the education level that they had, based on their own middle class upbringing, um, and lack, complete lack of understanding of intergenerational trauma, what residential schools do, what reserves are, what urban indigenous people are. And they were also trying to prove something professionally. They were trying to prove that their profession should be taken seriously. So there's a lot of overlapping, um, difficult to communicate in a single sentence issues going on all at the same time. And I think it's really important that we have these hard conversations and we have these um, long conversations about uh, the 60s scoop and the millennial scoop and we stop perpetuating the idea that it happened in the past and we should get over it. And the, the best way I can illustrate that is by using myself as an example, is that, um, like I said earlier in this lecture, I was bounced around in foster care um, basically as soon as I was born until I was eight. And then I was placed into an adoption placement where every all of the adults around me knew that um, the people who adopted me weren't going to stay on my territory like they weren't from my territory um, they weren't gonna stay there long term and that eventually I would be alienated from the land like maybe they didn't think of it in those same terms but 
it wasn't, um, they didn't see that sort of alienation and loss of culture as a negative. They thought that, um, well, they thought that they were saving me. They thought that um, indigenous parents can't take care of their own children. And that underlying assumption was how I was raised. I was raised to be ashamed of my skin color. I was raised to believe that alcoholism and addiction and stupidity um, were my blood right. That, that I shouldn't identify, I should try as hard as I can to not identify as indigenous. And for a long time, I thought I was white. I thought, I, I thought that <laughs> if I tried hard, if I dressed differently, if I succeeded, if I went to university, that I would one day become white. And that, it, that kind of thinking is exactly why I think that the 60s scoop and the millennial scoop was a completely effective form of assimilation and colonization and over the long term genocide because um, internal, internalizing those things um, was something that was bred into me very, very young. And I'm very grateful and I'm lucky in a lot of ways, literally lucky. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not like discounting my own like intelligence or anything like that. I'm literally lucky to have met the people that I've met and been able to have access to resources and I mean, I have a lot of student debt, but I do have an education to fall back on and I do have an intellectual understanding of what's going on. Um, yeah, so when I am working on this stuff, I, I understand that I have a lot of my own healing to do and this is kind of um, an extension of indigenous research methods is that my research is a form of healing and my ceremony that I put into it or like that I bring with me um, in what I do is all part of it's research but it's also part of um, indigenous people telling indigenous stories and indigenous people telling indigenous history and I think that's really important. All right, so this um, final part of my lecture is going to be about my dissertation research. Um, I'm not quite done my proposal, but I'm on my way. Um, my dissertation is going to be a couple of different parts. The first part will be locating myself. I'll write a chapter about like kind of the stuff that I talked about at the beginning here. And then I'm going to talk about indigenous research methods and I'm going to talk about the development of the welfare state. So um, as much as I am steeped in my own culture, I'm also steeped in the mainstream culture and I think I have a lot to add to discussions about the welfare state and how it was developed. Um, and then the bulk of my dissertation is going to be around three survivors of the scoop. Um, myself, I'll be the last one because I was scooped in 1992. Um, Cody's dad will be the first one. He's going to anchor uh, my dissertation. He was um, scooped in 1950 and he spent quite a few years um, being surveilled by um, the Canadian state in one form or another. Um, Cody's in uh, entire family basically tells us the story of this nation through surveillance of indigenous people from one form or another, was whether it's residential school, um, the military and the war years, um, through the 60s scoop and child welfare. It's actually really fascinating and I'm very lucky and I'm very grateful to Cody and his dad for allowing me to do that. So um, the third person that I'm going to be talking about is um, my good friend and community advisor, a role that I made up at York um, to include more indigenous voices in the PhD process. 
uh, her name's Corey, and um, she was scooped um, in the 1970s. So basically, I'm going to be writing about the 60s scoop from 1950 until now, because all three of us overlap um, in temporally, but also how each one of our cases is like handled over the time over this period is like really interesting and it changes and um i'm really excited that um i'm gonna be looking into like pieces of legislation so something that i learned from cody's dad's files is that the military was involved in some way which is like a really interesting thing i didn't i i always thought that i could just ignore the veterans charter and the veterans um uh, resettlement act which was like a thing the Canadian government did to like disenfranchise more people from their land was like take land away from indigenous people and give it to veterans because like how could you not um, so that's really interesting to bring that in and that's really interesting to my supervisor who's like m much better versed at that stuff so I have lots to learn I have lots to go through um, Essentially, I want my dissertation to show that the first-person narratives are crucial to understanding the long-term effects of the child welfare system. It's not like a one-and-done thing. It really messes you up. It messes you up in, in weird, interesting ways, but it also gives us this crazy resiliency that I really want to like look into and I really want to document in that we're all like successful in our own ways and we're all like messed up in our own ways and I want that like tension to be like represented. So the way that I insert indigenous research methods into my dissertation is that I have personal relationships with these people. That the story is going to happen when the story happens and um, I'm invested, like I'm invested in these people. I'm They're important community members and it's giving us all the feeling that our experiences mean something. Like, not saying that like, this is the good that comes out of it because that's too reductive, but um, just that, I don't know, that someone will be able to hear our stories or read our stories and find themselves reflected. Um, in a way that indigenous people don't tend to be in the development of the welfare state discussions because even saying things like the welfare state kind of indicates where your political affiliations are or like your worldview and I'm trying to add something that hasn't been added before and so um, it's just like really important that we have our voices reflected in in those things so each of the stories that I talked about will be couched in the context of their time our stories provide natural periodization in post-war and contemporary history from 1950 to 1921 or 1921 2021 um, the, co the context of each of our stories will be recreated by financial and organizational records from federal and provincial governments from Ontario Alberta and Saskatchewan Legislation relevant to the time will also be examined in each case. Um, we are, William, Corey, and I were all raised as urban indigenous people and targeted for various reasons by several levels of surveillance and enforcement. These levels of surveillance range from neighbors to social workers to police officers and court officials. Although each of the actors at the center of the story were born in disparate places, we all ended up in, in Ontario. We range in age from 71 to 28, and our, over, our stories overlap for a reason. So some of the things I'll be looking into closer are the Soldier Settlement and Veterans Land Act, the Children's Protection Act, the Liquor Control Board, the Morality Squ Squad, and um, the Child Welfare Act in the 1970s, and how social workers kept running records of people. Um, so for me, I, I have Corey's records, I have Bill's records, but I cannot find my Children's Aid Society records because I think bureaucracy, 
the bureaucracy is confused by my status because I was in foster care for a while and then I moved to an adoption placement. So I, and then I moved to Ontario and I've changed my name like six times. Um, but I've basically got all the documents I can from the post adoption registry in Saskatchewan, but it didn't include any social worker notes. So I know like really basic things about myself, like how I can't find my father. <laughs> they did a father search and like nothing came up and I, I don't know what they did. Did they just like Google this guy's name? I don't know. But I know like basic facts. I know that um, my mother was 15 when I was born. She was um, she was targeted by social workers because of her age and because she was unwed and because the father wasn't in the picture. Um, my mother was 15. I'm a, I'm a second child. Um, my older brother, um, Joseph, also has like his own separate story from mine, although we were adopted together. Um, I just haven't figured out like how to integrate that into my narrative yet. Um, but he's 18 months older than me. And we have, I, presumably, we have the same father because we look like the boy and girl version of each other, but I don't know. Anyways, um, still looking into his documents as well. Um, and I think that might add some more information. I'm not, I'm not really sure. But I know that my mother is 15 with two kids and my father was 32 and he wasn't involved. And I think that I identify less with my Vietnamese side because, well, partially because no one ever told me that I have learning disabilities because I'm Vietnamese or that I'm going to, if it weren't for the people who adopted me, then I would be working on the street corner, which is like something that they used to tell me all the time, which I didn't understand at the time. And I think I had to Google it, but um, yeah, I feel, I feel like negative reinforcement uh, really made me identify more with my indigenous side but also just based on like the age differences and like the fact that she was alone at the hospital I don't think that reconnecting with the Vietnamese side of my family is part of my narrative um, I don't think that when I go find my I have found my family in Saskatchewan I had a very awkward brief conversation with my mother that lasted two minutes and I just don't think she's ready for me. Um, but I do have extended family in Saskatchewan and I my goal, my goal in the next couple of years is to reach out to them and see if I can be brought back into my community or at least um, learn a little bit more about where I came from specifically instead of just like these um, government document details. Um, but I don't think that the Vietnamese side of my family is integrated and uh yeah i mean i could go on <laughs> i could go on forever <laughs> with this stuff um some of my research questions going forward are what can we learn about the welfare state from the case notes of social workers over time how are scoop survivor stories different how are our stories similar and what can we learn from healing journeys couched in institutional education i.e post-secondary so um, I'm pretty sure I'm going to be joining the um, tutorial that you have on Monday. So if you have any questions after watching this lecture, just write them down and we can talk about them after the weekend. Thanks so much for listening and uh, have a great weekend.